My name is Jack Nisbet. I'm a writer. And what I really try to work on is the intersection of human and natural history and time. And Hayman Creek works really, really well for that. We're at the junction of a bunch of Miocene basalt that came up 17 million years ago and stopped very near here at the Spokane River. And then there's all this granite and hard rock on the other side. And if you look upstream this way to the east, you can see the headwaters of Hangman Creek up above the Coeur d'Alene Reservation. So it's, it all came together, oh, about 13, 14,000 years ago. There were these huge floods at the end of the last ice age. And they roared down Rathburn Prairie, down through Spokane, what is now Spokane, and came across this area up upstream just a little bit and they came from the mouth upstream and they all met here in these huge eddies and tore this place up into what we see now and it, it is just a spectacular meeting place for many things it also provided there were people here when the ice age floods came and they've been here ever since and the Coeur d'Alene people use Hangman Creek to come to the Spokane River to the fisheries so we're on sort of this big highway at the edge of language families, language groups, family groups. And we're also at the edge of, of seasons. Right now we're kind of in the late spring, early summer wildflower season. So we're just going to walk around here. Um, the people that I have studied who write about this, are the first people to write about this, are right through the 19th century. David Thompson's the first guy to write about it in 1811. He makes a fantastic map that's the first map with Spokane River on it, but he does not include Hangman Creek, possibly because his tribal guides didn't show it to him. Then in 1826, the first real serious naturalist came here, David Douglas, that Douglas Fir is named after. He came with a fur trade group that was taking 100 horses from the confluence of the Clearwater and the Snake in Nez Perce country up to Spokane House and Fort Okanagan and Fort Colville to divide the horses up. And he came in right up Hayman Creek, right through here, and he collected plants in July of 1826. Then in June of 1893, a Swedish immigrant named John Lieberg made the first real, what I call, ecological plant survey of this area and he camped right below us here where the golf course is and spent some time here and collected plants. So we have these lists that we can compare through time. We have all this tribal oral information we can use and we can see where we are today. So all we're going to do today is look around, see what's here and see if we can go backwards and forwards in time. So we're on the high trail of the bluff, so you can really see how it's put together. Again, it was all swept by floods and loose sands and gravels of different sizes were left, and you get a pretty steep gradient. And the anchor of it, old and new, is blue bunch wheatgrass and these native bunch grasses, some of which are getting run around by weeds, and ponderosa pine trees. You can see different ages of them down here, and there's the creek. And then within that, there are all these wildflowers and plants that are set up for loose dirt. This is called velvet lupin. It's a loose, it's a late lupin. There are a couple other species that bloom earlier, but this is one of the very pretty ones and it's very woolly and velvety. A lot of the desert plants have that kind of wool on them. And here's the blue bunch wheatgrass, which by chance, it makes terrific food for horses. So the fur trade guys loved it. And the tribes, when horses arrived about 300 years ago, they learned to love it. But they, before horses, which is 10,000, 12,000, 14,000 years of their life, they're more interested in some of the cultural plants that grow here, which we will talk about as we get to them. So the cultural plants that we're talking about, David Thompson and David Douglas were always hungry. The tribes are always feeding them. They always want red meat and the tribes are always giving them roots and berries and fish. 
like 24, 28 different kinds of berries. David Thompson called these June berries. We call them service berries. They're the first ones to come on. So we're right at the beginning of July and they're just coming on. They go from green to red to black. They are delicious. They are abundant. This is a decent year. And that's all you really need to know. David Thompson and his fur trade, French Canadian mixed blood fur trade guys that were with him hated it but they're always picking handfuls of berries that they go, and the tribes are always giving them baskets of berries, and you can see why. This is one plant, and as we walk the bluffs, you see more and more and more service berry. So, look, now we're into clumps of service berry. Again, the berries are just coming on. There's really good food on there, vitamin A and vitamin C. But look down in the middle of them, that's an elderberry. They're just in bloom and they'll be food uh, 10 weeks, 12 weeks from now. Once you see each berry, the first ones, then the clock is started that the tribes go around with and they know all these different places that they tell Thompson and Douglas to go and to, so they can feed themselves. But the thing about the bluffs, the magic thing about the bluffs is that we wind around and there's different aspects and different exposures. So even though it's July 2nd and we are stuck with that day, just every time we go around a curve, we're going further back into spring or more deeply into summer. And here's an example of that. This is a um, Oregon sunshine, woolly sunshine, a beautiful composite flower that David Douglas collects and then John Lieberg collects and there's a there's a one in the uh, herbarium in Pullman that Lieberg collected from the bluffs here and they're still in bloom they've been in bloom for six weeks you just have to go to the right place So here's the sweep. We're at a place that is open bunch grass. We're looking down towards Vinegar Flats. There's a, the last farmhouse along the creek that is now going to be a housing development. And there's, that's the next challenge that the Bluffs has to face is the access from that up. But that's, the whole Bluffs used to be that. When John Lieberg was here in 1893, um, what he saw looked like vinegar flats. He saw a lot of vegetable gardens that were feeding the boom town that was Spokane. He saw several sawmills that had been cutting ponderosa pine from the flats and a little bit from the bluffs and they were already closed down because they had used up the trees. Now we're seeing, you can see some of these trees growing up the draws of the bluff and they tend to be wide open spaces between them. That's the look that David Thompson describes, the tribes managing the land with fire. You get big old ponderosa pines and bunch grass in between with these kind of forbs and shrubs and berries that we're talking about. Here we are below 33rd Avenue. We're going downstream on the bluffs. Um, we've got some great wildflowers. Again, bunch grass is holding this all together. Here is, uh, this is called Canactus. It's a, it's a little, quite attractive foliage wildflower that David Douglas collected from here and is a common garden plant in England now and is all over the bluffs. Here's the blue bunch wheatgrass. But this is heartleaf buckwheat, and this grows in big clumps on healthy parts of the bluff and is one of the things holding the soil together. And it has these beautiful flowers that are going away now, real creamy colored, and then these stems that start out yellow and then green, and now they're turning to this leathery brownish color that'll stay all winter. This remains a beautiful plant all winter, and because of that, uh, people here plant it for, as a butterfly attractant. It's a great garden plant. But again, it's a popular garden plant in Europe because David Douglas sent it back in 1826. And then this leads right to one of these pines. Again, Ponderosa pine is the one tree that you'll see here. This is an old tree that lay down on the hill and lived until about five years ago and is now slowly dying. And 
we can rub its belly, which is the way we like to think about these ponderosas when they are about a hundred years old the bark starts to turn red and gets these big jigsaw puzzle pieces that people love and then from then on it gets oranger and redder and smells more and more like vanilla for the next hundred years and more and then when it gets to be about 200 or 250 these jigsaw puzzle pieces start to flatten back out and they get to be called yellow bellies then and this one is getting yellowy i'd love to know how old it is the size of the tree has nothing to do with its age. Um, we've done these walks with Guy Gifford, and he has, takes an increment borer, and we've aged some ponderosas at 350 years on the bluff that don't look like amazing trees until you start thinking about a tree that was already old when white contact was made, when David Thompson came here. And this tree has just amazing things about it. And I'd love to know how long it will be before it passes away and is just, you know, blows away the bark and everything is all dust. But right now it's going slowly away. And we love it for it. Behind me is one of the older bridges across Hangman Creek. And there's an oil train going across it, of course taking empties back to the Williston Basin in North Dakota. This bridge was not here when John Lieberg was here in 1893. Um, railroads were the whole world, though, of moving people back and forth. His wife was a doctor who worked for the railroad. When he was in out doing plant surveys, he drove on the railroad grades and of grades that were just being built that didn't have trains running on them yet. And again, farms like this one in front were part of the scene here when he was here that were already well established and now you can see vinegar flats behind us and that's that's the settlement where they grew the vegetables for Spokane so a lot of this is just in the process of changing it's it, in other words there was 10 or 12,000 years of tribal work there was 200 years of the white world as John Lieberg saw it. He was about halfway between us and David Thompson in contact. When Thompson came, this creek, uh, the people that lived on here were called the Muddy Creek people because when you go to the mouth of Hangman Creek, it is always distinctly more muddy than the water of the Spokane River. And that's a simple reason. There are all these wind-blown Palouse Hills upstream and the soil is very loose and now with farming it is really tilled up and really muddy but even back then the creek was always cutting into the hills and there would be little landslides and the muddy creek people worked really well to describe how it how this creek is different than the big river Now, the thing about the bluff that anybody will tell you that walks it regularly, which is a lot of people, is that it is full of surprises. And a lot of them are built on this idea that we're now around another corner, we have a different aspect, it's going to get the wind a little differently, it's going to get a different amount of sunshine. And because we've just had some recent end of June rains, there's this plant that's up that is usually uh, a little earlier in the season, and it's usually not as common. And I've, again, I never see them here. It's an, it's an amazing saprophytic plant that lives on dead things, has no chlorophyll, is called clustered broom rape. It doesn't really even have a nice common name. But if you look at it closely, it's astonishingly beautiful and is an astonishing color. So it's hard not to come around the corner if, uh, and go, whoa, wh where is that coming from? Why is that here? And again, David Douglas sees this. Um, he collects the different species downstream on the Columbia near Fort Vancouver and then it just goes away and it's not seen for almost 200 years before until um, some of the management people set fires, started setting fires again and these broom rapes are often fire stimulated. But there's other things that stimulate them too obviously and we'd love to know what they are feeding on here. They are, they are working on the roots of this buckwheat that we looked at just a minute ago. They, they have a relationship with them that involves mycorrhiza and fungi and dyeing and uh, processing 
and going away and turning into something else. And this is like an intermediate yellow stage here. We love them. And, and if you have a kids here, as we often take kids on the bluff, and they can see something like this, this is what they would remember from this walk. They would not get anything else I said, but they would remember the clustered broom rake because of its funny color. So again, we're in a little draw. It, it doesn't get the direct sun because there's some uh, foliage here. And here's, here's the bunch grass looking greener than a lot of what we've seen. And then here's a little skull cap, which is a terrific tiny flower that is very beautiful that David Douglas collects in 1826. So, so um, and then Lieberg gets it again in 1893. So, to me, the reason that I'm so fascinated with all this is that they just seem to collapse time with me. If, they, if it was here 200 years ago, it was here 2,000 years ago. It was probably here 12,000 years ago. And the, the, you know, this draw was collapsing down and it had its aspects and its changes, but the skull cap is probably a constant somewhere on the bluff. These upper trails on the bluff, especially the one we're on, I'm trying to talk them into calling the Biscuit Root Trail because there are all these plants that are in the same family as the parsley and carrots that, that you grow in your garden that are amazing and are cultural plants for the tribes. And here's one in seed here called Gray's Biscuit Root that um, blooms really early and it has these wonderful seeds with oil ducts in them that sm have distinct smells that you will recognize from caraway, licorice, all those are um, umbellifer family plants. And they, they're abundant here and you can see the seeds are abundant. We'll see tons of them. And then around them you can see there's several kinds of onions up here. This is a, an onion that's a cultural plant that's, that making is, is making seed. Here's a, a, a beautiful colomia that is just about to come out that David Douglas collected. Here is a clematis that's a vine with white flowers. We have three kinds of clematis here. One of them's called Douglas clematis. This is white clematis and it, it was around for a long time and since people came it has increased and is all, like, a lot like a weed, acts a lot like a weed. Each plant has its own story and it doesn't have to do what we want it to do or follow our story at all. They're on their own track. So again, there's many weeds that are encroaching on the bluffs. But John Lieberg, when he was here in 1893, just uh, a week out of here collected the first cheatgrass collected in North America, I mean in, in the United States, and said it was, might be a problem weed. He saw Russian thistle coming up and said it might be a problem weed. But he also saw other plants that were already considered weeds that have faded away in the century since. So it's really, we, we can't tell plants what to do, is the message, I think. And this clematis is a really good example. It's a pretty vine that crawls all over the place and looks great when it's just in, in proportion to the rest of the plants around it. It's not always in proportion anymore. Then if you come around the corner, you get into a whole bank of another, another uh, sort of late bloomer called stonecrop. This this yellow, beautiful yellow plant that grows out of the rocks and is real common in the shrub step. You see it more in the shrub step, but here it is all over the place here, perfectly happy and, and part of the scene, very much part of the scene here on the bluffs. And then downslope, you can still see some more stone crop there growing in the base of this round leaf eucara or alum root. And, and sometimes, the kind, I'm not a big fan of common names, but, but usually because there's so many for each plant. But this is a good one. It speaks to how this is a plant with a circumpolar range. In other words, it grows in Asia and Europe and in North America, different species of it. Alum is a common you know, it's, it's a herb with a use, uh, or as a medicine, it's what your granny used with her pickles to put in her dill pickles. This is alum root. So that's named by European people. The tribes see it completely differently, but they do use this. They use it for different things than the Europeans did. But 
There's no such thing as them, as somebody with knowledge of the outdoors walking past a plant that's this distinct and not having a story about it and a use for it and a relationship with it. That's what's important, is seeing it over time, over these thousands of years and developing a relationship with it. And this is a beauty. One reason is that this, will, this has been out for a month and it will be out for another month. All these other things will fade away and the alum root will still be looking strong there. Strong, power, that's what medicine is. Strength is medicine and healing. So that they pick up on that. People pick up on that. Another aspect of the bluffs that is so fascinating is, again, it's only been 150 years, say, or 40 years since, since white people were here, but they, they make such an impact. So this is mock orange or syringa, which is a native shrub. This is the service berry that we've looked at, which is a native shrub that's important. This, there's all kinds of native cherries here. There's two really important kinds of cher native cherry trees. This is a planted one, because again, cherries are circumpolar and Europeans know about them too, and they bring these ones over to plant. This is not a bad little crop of cherries here, but they aren't, and they're, they're still be edible, but they aren't as good as service berries. So now we're gonna just ease up the hill a little bit and show you what all these are growing in. So again, here's service berry with berries just ready to eat. There's syringa with a couple of white flowers still on it. You can still smell the orange. And then here is locust, which is, and all this whole draw is locust because every homesteader from back east would bring a locust tree with them because that's what they had in their yard in Iowa or North Carolina or Connecticut. Then this is where they dump debris from the top of the bluff that has rolled down. These bricks. Uh, some of them as late as Expo 74, they dumped a lot of things in these gulches from above. And you could say, what a disaster. <laughs> or you could say, some of these plants don't care. They can, the, the nature of the Ice Age floods and all this really loose soil and debris is what some of these plants are adapted for. And this is just another dump truck load of loose debris. They're used to whole counties of loose debris to deal with. So this is an amazing look to think, wow, they, they dump trash in this to that extent that it could come this far down the hill? The answer is yes, and there's places on the bluffs that are much more amazing as for volume, but plants are so adaptable and so good at what they do, but other plants can do it too. I mean, the locust seems to be doing better than anything else right in this little draw that we're in now. So it's really hard to understand it's probably beyond our ability to understand all the different forces at work on these bluffs. All we can do is sort of walk along them and feel them at work. So again, it's really hard to separate things out. Here's a young pine tree. Here's a, all these blue flowers are from Europe. These are bachelor buttons or corn flower. But look at the euchre, the alum root sticking up underneath them and the waxberry is native. It's a real, uh, John Lieberg had these great quotes in 1893. He sees a war between the desert plants and the wet homestead weeds. And he says right now in this place the weeds might be winning and in this place the desert plants might be winning. I, I'm not betting against the alum root in the long run. And here's one that really I wouldn't bet against. This is the Colomia that David Douglas collected in 1826, and it's named after him, one of his favorite plants, and a very unusual color, very unusual color. And uh, it's, it's so strange. And again, it's a popular garden plant in England. If you go visit England after the plague leaves, somebody and go in the backyard of somebody's little cottage they'll have this blooming but you can see what it likes it likes just the worst conditions you can think of then douglas named that there's there's an onion named after david douglas but this one is he named after his mentor william jackson hooker this is hooker's onion and it is a again 
a plant of dry wastelands to, to a lot of people's eyes, but it's perfect for the bluffs. The bluffs are far from being a dry wasteland, and, and everybody, all the early people that came here could easily see that. John Lieberg was just, he was out of his mind that he wasn't getting here till the second week in June, first week in June, because he wanted to be here the second week in April when all these biscuit roots and everything were blooming. But what you learn, if you, again, if you just walk it every day, is that it never stops from the end of March until now, until next week, until August, and all through the year, there are new things to see on the bluffs here. So David Thompson, again, is hungry. David Douglas is hungry. They are at Spokane House further down the river at about the same time of year. And the tribes say, look, there's three kinds of currents that are going to be coming on. The first kind are these orange ones. They aren't the best, but they are okay. And they have these little mitten-like leaves. They're quite beautiful. They're, again, they're quite a part of the scene here, and there's a lot of them. Thompson called them gooseberries because he's from England and Wales, right? And they are in that world. And you want to wait for the... You want to eat these when they're available if you're hungry, but you want the golden currants to come on because they're the best tasting ones. And down at the mouth of Hangman Creek, there are abundance of golden currants. Right now, these are the, this is the tail end of these sticky currants, wax currants, that uh, a lot of people don't like. But again, they have a lot of vitamin A and C in it, and they're liquid. And when you're hungry in a hot weather place, that's what you want. Here's another kind of current. Here's another kind of biscuit root putting up its little seeds, and you can tell it's clearly different from the grazed biscuit root that we saw. But what we're looking at, if you look up the hill and think of things rolling down and think of the floods rolling at this level through, you start really going crazy when you see rocks like this. This is a granitic rock, probably from Mount Spokane, that came down the hill and hit this pine tree hard. The pine tree adjusted and has grown around it and is in that real thick stage where it's just starting to turn red. You know, it's probably a hundred year old tree with some severe damage that it is trying to alleviate by just with gum, by pouring the gum out. And it looks good. From the top, you would never know that this tree took a wound. I mean, this would be like taking most of your leg off or one leg off, say, and then saying, oh, I'm okay. It's only a flesh wound. So then you start thinking, now, wait a minute, where did this come from? So when the Ice Age floods came, there were ice rafts with big boulders on them, and they might get lodged upstream of this and roll down. Or, as we saw before, people can roll down. People can roll debris down. And I don't know where this came from, but I know it's not basalt, which is what, what was here. Now we are at this nose of crumbling land that to me is what the bluffs are really all about. It's the reason I took this trail, I think, is you can see that this is water carved, wind carved, and it's also some, probably some dump truck debris, and it should be just a total mess. And yet this has the most diverse suite of wildflowers on it of anywhere that we've been today, it led off by the purple sage, which is, one of the totem plants of the shrub snap, of course, but it's just abundant here. I mean, look, it's all up the hill. And there's a hummingbird just right over it. Can you see the hummingbird diving on it? <laughs> there he is. So you can sit here and watch a hummingbird work all these purple sage all morning. That's what the bluffs are about. And then you start looking around of what else is in there. Here's, here's some more of the clustered broom rape just peeking up that we saw earlier on. Um, here's the buckwheat uh, that the purple sage is encroaching on. It looks like this buckwheat is going to lose to this clump of purple sage, but again, never get against buckwheat. And then you look downhill, it's all just eroding away. Is it just going to all go to hell? Probably not. But what we're not seeing here is the bunch grass to hold it all together, to hold the soil together, because it's flowing too fast for it to get in. But what's able to get in is this astonishing plant that is still green, 
that is another one of these umbellifers. It's in the biscuit root family and it's called turpentine weed. It has the most amazing smell and you can, the leaves are still green even at this time of year so you can crush them up and smell them and use them for medicine or whatever. And all the other biscuit roots that bloomed in March and April are long gone and dried up and gone away like we've seen them. And the turpentine weed is just forming. It's these very strange little cylindrical seeds. This is a magic plant that you do not see very much in Spokane County that is very common here. Whenever you see green on a little plant, that's the turpentine weed. Everything else is dried up. And look up the hill and look down the hill. There's little spots of it everywhere. And, and then it, again, and little clumps of purple sage. So you go, well, what is different than all this other area we've walked around here? It's just, that's the magic of the bluffs, is every little aspect and every little movement of soil and grains of sand below you give you these different looks and whole habitats, really. This is a separate habitat from any place that we've been. So down here, and again, we picked today to come. If we came next week, this would be Blazing Star, which is this amazingly beautiful white flower with bright lemon yellow filaments, lots of them for the male parts. They'd be waving in the wind and we'd be going, that's the most beautiful flower I've ever seen. And the purple sage would be gone, you wouldn't even see it. Because it just, it just is like a wave. Once you get this calendar started with the first biscuit roots in late February, early March, or the first berries that are going to come on with the service berry in April that just rolls on through the year. That's, that's what it does. It does not care about the plague. It does not care about people. All it's doing is, is what it does. And the, it doesn't care if this hillside comes completely apart, if there's a torrential rain shower and just blows this whole thing away. The roots of these are so deep that they'll be back stronger next year. They are very resilient. And John Lieberg had some really good quotes about the resiliency of the forest, the resiliency of the shrub steppe in the face of all these degradations that people are putting it through. You just cannot stop them. If you look this way, if, if Trevor turns around and looks this way, he's looking at weeds and we're going, boy, what this place is messed up. This place is beyond hope, but it's not because something will happen that will tear up this part of the hillside or time will happen in these weeds that, that particular skeleton weed will cycle back into balance with the rest of what's around it but the balance is different each time it comes back that's what's hard for humans to accept because de we deal with such a short span in our little vision you have to deal in centuries and millennia and then you can see that it's constantly changing and constantly coming into you know chaos to order order to chaos over and over again but the order is different each time it comes back these are very dynamic systems and that's why i like this place this is a really dynamic little no nose of hillside right here that is coming apart and staying together at the same time and it's the purple sage is irresistible. The smells of the turpentine weed and the purple sage are just, it's more than you can bear on a hot, quiet day. Right now the wind's blowing so hard we can't smell it. Okay, we are back at 37th Avenue where we started. You can look over my shoulder and see the headwaters of Hangman Creek up on the Coeur d'Alene Res and think about the creek rolling down here, coming past the bluffs for several miles and then coming out in the Spokane River and how you can walk it any day, any time, all through the years and see something different. So thanks a lot for coming and we will see you out here.